What I'm going to do in this next video is have a look at uh, relative motion again. But I want to have a look at something about the constancy of the speed of light. Now I've told you already light travels at 3 by 10 to the 8 meters per second, or C, 1C. But how is that measured and can it change depending on the motion of the observer? So this belongs to the textbook, section 9.2, page 252. I'll also refer to an earlier section, 8.5, page 230, which is just a little section on light. But let's start with uh, looking at some relative motion. Now imagine this, this is a, an old favourite. Um, you have to imagine this to be a boat. So it's a boat with a mast, but it's any object that can move and it's just got a you know, vertical mast. Now, <coughs> um, the idea was in the original story that this was um, a mast where they dropped a cannonball. So someone let a cannonball go from the top of the mast while this was stationary and it just fell straight down. So I'll just draw that in. So can you imagine that there's the motion of the ball and it ends up down there. So when the, when the boat or the, uh, the basically the cart is stationary and you let it go, it just goes down like that. Now you're at rest relative to this object and so am I. So we're both in the same frame of reference. But let's imagine we've got another frame of reference where this boat is moving. So instead of you seeing it go like that, it's going to drop, but this is going to be moving at the same time. Now I'm going to drop it, this is a bit tricky to do, I'm going to drop it at the same time as it gets past that point. So here it is here, as it goes past I drop it and it would keep going like that. So it ends up at the base of the mast in the same way. Let's do that again. It's, I'm going to drop it there and it goes down and ends up at the bottom of the mast. Okay, so depending on your frame of reference, it'll either go straight down or it'll go in that sort of um, parabolic motion. Okay, now you're familiar with, familiar with that from projectile motion. So who is right? We're both right. If we're both at rest, we see it going like this. If um, the boat is moving, it goes like in that parabolic motion to you, who, who is at rest with respect to this. But to a person aboard the boat, now let's imagine I'm aboard the boat and I drop it as it's moving along. I just see it going vertically down to my feet. Okay, so it makes no difference. So to you, if that took one second to drop, to you, let's say this is 10 metres, 10 metres per second. So it would do the 10 metres in one second. If it went this way, now obviously that path is longer, let's say it's 13 metres, so it would go the 13 metres in one second. So here it might be 10 metres per second, here it might be 13 metres per second. Okay, I don't know if you can see that. So 10 and 13. So depending on the motion of the object, you can have different relative velocities. So the velocity of the ball in this case, to you as a stationary observer, sees this moving and would, would measure the, um, the velocity of the object as 13. To a person aboard the vessel, would still see it falling the 10 metres because they're moving along with it and it'd be 10 metres per second. So both are right, it just depends on the viewpoint of the observer. So that's an old favourite. Now let's have a look at something about the addition of velocities. Now I'll just get rid of this. Let's imagine we're looking at some object, in this case here I'm just using a little train and on the top of it imagine I've got a cannon. Now that train can move along a track and let's say it can fire a ball at the same time. Now let's say the cannon, let's say the when they're at rest, let's imagine the ball, the velocity of the ball relative to the train is say 100 meters per second. So when they're at rest like this, the velocity of the ball relative to the train is 100. Now let's say we've also got the velocity of the train, AIN, relative to the Earth, 
of say 10 meters per second. Now I think you can see what I'm getting at. So if they're like that and the the train is moving at 10 and the ball is projected at 100 relative to the train, the speed of the ball relative to the earth is 110. So let's do that again. Let's imagine it's at rest. The ball moves at 100 relative to the train and now if the train's not moving relative to the earth the velocity of the ball relative to the earth is 100 but if the train is moving at 10 and it shoots the ball forward at 100 relative to the train the ball speed relative to the earth is 110 so you can just add the two together okay now that's pretty straightforward it's like a cricketer delivering a ball if the cricketer can run at say um, one meter per second or whatever 10 meters per second and delivers a ball at 10 meters per second relative to himself or herself the total speed of the ball relative to the ground would be the two added together be 20 for instance okay so that's looking at real objects that have mass like that so you can just add the velocities together let's now repeat this but let's forget about um, objects like cannons let's imagine we've got something like a a um, beam of light now I'm, I'm just using a little laser pointer here you can see it lights up now I'll put that on top of the train like before and let's see what happens okay so <coughs> I can have that on the train and I can shoot the beam forward like that now you know from what we've done in the previous work that the velocity of the light equals c equals 3 by 10 to the 8 meters per second okay so that that beam of light leaves the train when I do that it leaves the train at 3 by 10 to the 8 relative to the train now if I move the train along at a certain speed now to make these numbers add up let's say I've got a super fast train and the V of the train let's say can be 0.1 C okay now I know that's too fast it's much faster than the train could go but for the purposes of this so this train can travel at high speed now the question is what's the speed of the light coming out of the train so you know that the speed of the light is 1c when it does that but when the train is moving and I add the 1c onto it if you could measure the speed of light would it be 1 plus 0.1 would it be 1.1c so in other words would you measure the speed of light to be 1.1c and the answer is no you still get 1c the, the uh, speed of light is c it doesn't change okay in a vacuum that's the speed of light doesn't change it doesn't matter what you do to the source of light it could be it could be 0.5 C or 0.9 C um, this value here wouldn't change so the speed of light doesn't change so that's the tricky thing about light um, I've seen questions on the uh, external exam or the mock exams where they have questions like this and say what will be the speed of light relative to the train and they'll have you know 1.1 C or something like that and the answer is C 1 C doesn't change now um, this all came about in the late 1890s there was a Scottish scientist called James Clerk Maxwell and he measured he he did a theoretical calculation on the speed of light electromagnetic radiation now that's what's covered in this section here so we're going to have to go back over and look at that as well um, it basically says the speed of light is 1c now when Maxwell did the calculations the end, re end result of his calculations had a speed and it had this number here and he thought what is that relative to is it relative to the earth or the air or the star or the sun or whatever and he said there was nothing it wasn't relative to anything the calculations were done and it didn't come out as being relative to anything so he said that's the speed of light irrespective of the um, frame of reference you're in it doesn't matter if you're moving and the source of that is moving you get the same number so Einstein ran with that he said 
in his uh, 18, no, 1905 um, paper on special relativity that the speed of light in a vacuum, C, is constant. Um, so that's what we've ended up with. So remember, it never goes more than that. Now, um, a couple of things that um, would come into this. I, you have to be careful not to add um, the speeds on. Um, so Einstein used to pose a question like this. He'd say, let's say I had a mirror and I was looking at myself in a mirror. Now let's imagine this is a mirror. Now you're looking at yourself in this mirror. I'll just get rid of the stuff on the board. It's distracting. Now let's imagine you're looking at yourself in a mirror. Now what's happening is the overhead light is coming down, striking my face, and the beam of light is leaving my face, going to the mirror, and then coming back to my eyes. Okay, so um, there is a time lag between those two distances. Now let's imagine I could have my arm one and a half meters away. Now I know that's only about a meter, but let's imagine it's one and a half meter. So the light hits my eyes, uh, hits my face, goes to the mirror, and comes back to my eyes. So I'm seeing light that has left my face after it traveled one and a half meters there and one and a half meters back. Now that would be three meters. The question is how long does it take light to travel that three meters? Well um, S, uh, sorry, V equals S on T. We've got T equals S on V, three meters divided by the speed of light and you get 10 to the negative 8 seconds. Okay, so um, that's basically what 10 nanoseconds. 10 nanoseconds. So it's it's less than a millionth of a second. It's nearly one billionth of a second, or it's 10 billionths of a second. So what you're seeing really is your face when you were 10 nanoseconds younger. So you're seeing a younger version of yourself. So the light strikes your face, it takes 10 nanoseconds to get back to your eyes. So when you look in a mirror, you're not seeing yourself like you are now. You're seeing yourself as a younger version of yourself. You're seeing yourself 10 nanoseconds earlier. Now if you could move this away to six meters away, you'd have It'd even be, um, you'd be seeing yourself even younger. If you could move it away far enough, you could see yourself very young. Now, when I look at people in the classroom, let's say I'm one and a half meters away from a student in the front row, Kate, one and a half meters away. Now, light strikes her face and comes to me. Now, let's say, or well, let's pick someone who's three meters away, up the back of the room, such. Um, Kate will choose the other Kate at the back of the room. Light strikes her face. It takes three. It's three meters before it can get to my eyes. So in that three meters, it took ten nanoseconds. So when I look around the room, I'd be seeing people in the back row, three meters away, ten nanoseconds younger than they really are. They'd be seeing me ten seconds younger than I really am. So we'd both look younger to each other. Okay, so that's that's just about the, uh, the constancy of the speed of light. Now, just to finish off this section, I um, just want to talk about a question that Einstein posed um, when he was looking at, him, well, he was considering what would happen if you looked at yourself in a mirror. Now, let's imagine this is a mirror. I'm looking at myself in it. Now, the light travels from my face to the mirror and back again. Now, what would happen if I moved, if the light struck my face, but I was running at the speed of light, so I was going like this. Now, what would I see in the image? Now, the question is, light is trying to get to the mirror from my face, but the mirror is moving away from the light. Okay, and if the mirror is going at 1C and the light's going at 1C, the light would never catch up. So, it, would it look blank? Or would, what would happen? The question, that's the question Einstein posed. What would you see in a mirror if you could run at the speed of light and looking at yourself? Well, 
The answer is quite simple. All you have to do is think, I'm stationary, it's you, people in the classroom, or the, the observers, are running that way at the speed of light. I'm staying still, but I have to move my feet because the Earth's turning underneath me. But as far as I'm concerned, I'm stationary, I'm not doing anything. The, I look at myself in the mirror, I see myself just as normal. So if the Earth starts to spin faster, or if you move, you move past me faster, I don't care what you're doing. I still see myself at the speed uh, as a normal image because the light is just coming down, hitting my face, going to the mirror and back. I don't care what you're doing. If you want to move that way at the speed of light, that's your business. You mightn't see my image, but I see my image. Okay, so that's uh, that's the re resolution to that paradox Einstein posed in 1905 about um, about the uh, image in a mirror. Now, look, just to finish off. Um, just to confirm this idea that you can't add on the velocity of the source of an object to the speed of light to get the, the extra speed of light, um, there's a pair of neutron stars in, it's about 1500 light years away. Now, these neutron stars um, are emitting radiation. Now that it takes light, if you imagine this is Earth down here, it takes light from those stars 1500 years to get to us, okay? Because the distance is 1500 light years. Now that's a unit of distance we'll do in unit, uh, in chapter, the next chapter, chapter 10. But, so that's how long it takes light to get um, from these burnt out stars, these neutron stars, to our eyes. But we can measure that. If you had an observatory on Earth, you could measure the starlight coming in. Now you can measure the speed of that starlight and it turns out to be the same. It turns out to be C. Because that's, that's Einstein's proposal. One of his propositions was that uh, the speed of light in a vacuum, which is basically air as well, um, has a constant value of C, or 3 by 10 to the 8. But the interesting thing is, these two stars are actually orbiting a central point. Now there's nothing there, it's just they're attracted to each other by gravity. So this one is coming forward, and that one's going away from us. So it's something like this. So if you had these two, they're going like that. So as far as you're concerned, you'd see this orange one with a face on it going away, and this one here, the red one, with a face coming towards you. So they'd rotate around each other like that. So at some stage, this one would be coming towards you. Now they're extremely high velocities. They're not 0.1c, but they're very high, and this one's going away from you. So the speed of light, in the old Newtonian idea, you would add the speed of this to the speed of the light, and get a value of maybe 1.1c. This one here, it's moving away, so the light's coming at 1c. You're losing 0.1, so it, you'd measure it as 0.9c. So you should see a difference in the speed of starlight if the idea was that you could add, or if the um, speed of light did change. Now when they measure this, they get the same value. Now this is mentioned in the textbook, um, and I'll give you some data on that. But it just goes to confirm the speed of light doesn't change. You don't add on the source of the speed of light. Now we're going to leave it there. There's some questions at the end of that chapter, uh, that section, really worth doing. It's just to confirm the idea of relative velocity. And we need that idea, particularly the idea of the mast on the ship and how the path of an object changes depending on the viewer. Because that comes up in two sections time when we work out a formula for uh, relating times and speeds. So I'll leave it there.